Oh dear, I've never been considered a retardant before. <laughs> My goal today is to advance thinking, not to retard it. But here I am, a dream fulfilled. I'm standing on cloud nine under this heavenly dome, which you'll hear about later, talking about explorers and our greatest journey ever. I grew up with explorers, and uh, I knew them through books, through films, through storytelling, and through my imagination. They were amazing, amazing people. Here is just one, Scott of the Antarctic. But Scott, like many of those great explorers, uh, were in a sense about conquering nature. And once they had found all the land there was to be found, we could try a bit of space perhaps, but we have a problem because we keep trying to exploit that land, those natural resources. And if we came on this journey of rape, pillage, and despoilation of the ecosystem, uh, there lies uh, real danger in that the ecosystem is our life support system. So what we need is a journey that's taking us another way about learning to live well within nature. That's very radical. That's astonishingly profound change in science, in technology, in culture, our values, our economics. In fact, it's a challenge so great, humankind hasn't come within cooey of ever getting close to that. That's the journey we're on. Those are the explorers, and that's us. We've all got to be part of this journey. And on the journey, we can tell great stories of explorers of the past and learn from them as we learn how to explore this new route. December last year, I fulfilled another childhood ambition. I went to Antarctica, thanks to Antarctic New Zealand. So Peter Beggs is out there. Thank you, Peter, for getting me there. As part of that trip, I went uh, with others to Cape Evans, to the Terra Nova hut that Scott and his colleagues built in 1910 in the shadow of Mount Erebus to launch their push for the pole, to be the first people to get to the remotest place in the world. And it was a race, because Roald Amundsen of Norway was trying to get it at the, going up the other side of the Ross Sea shelf. Um, it is an amazing hut, beautifully preserved. This is a photo I took last December, that Scott's bunk. On the table is the only penguin I saw in Antarctica. <laughs> I suspect it was 104 years old. The only live ones were some kilometers further north, up at Cape Royds, raising their chicks. I was glad to leave them in peace. But on that bunk, that is where Scott planned through the long, dark winter of 1910 and into 11 as to where and how they would get to the pole. Now, these guys had everything that Empire could provide them, including all the choicest food brands that are still there in the kitchen. And they had a few home comforts. On the table next to the penguin is this pictorial newspaper from Christchurch, dated 1908, talking about the great Christchurch fire. And quite right, too, because Christchurch was the place where Scott and his men had their last civilized meal. Well, the last meal in the civilized place, before they set sail to Antarctica. They had that meal at the Warner's Hotel, in the sh shadow, in the lee of the cathedral. Both buildings now dead and gone, but alive in our memories, and we have to keep telling the stories about the cathedral and all that happens there and the new life that grows out of uh, the cardboard cathedral. They also had one bicycle and two spare wheels <laughs> out in the stable. Now, what were these guys thinking that they would <laughs> pedal 1,300 kilometers to the South Pole. Well, they left the bikes behind, and they set out on November the 1st, 1911, and took 88 days to trudge those 1,300 kilometers across the Ross Ice Shelf, up the Beardmore Gas uh, Glacier, onto the uh, Arctic, Antarctic Plateau, and to the South Pole. When they arrived, they took this picture of themselves. 
They're so tired, they're so weather-beaten, I find it very difficult to work out which one is Scott. I'm assuming because of his naval rank and his social standing, he's the tall man in the middle standing next to the flag. I think it probably is him. But the reason that they look even more beaten up than you might expect after that long walk was they found a message when they got there left by Amundsen, who beat them by five weeks. They stayed two days. They turned round for the journey home. They trudged through unseasonably bad weather, poor rations, injury, illness, and the rest, for 61 days. They camped on March the 19th, still within sight of Mount Erebus, but a long way out on the ice shelf. There was great cock-ups by their support crew from Terra Nova about trying to rendezvous with them for more food. It's a harrowing story. Last December, I sat on the top of Observation Hill about an hour's walk from our Scott base that Ed Hillary founded in 1957. And I sat on top of that, and I looked at White Island and Black Island because the route to the South Pole is directly up there. Month after month, um, Scott's men stood watch on Observation Hill, trying to, hoping that they would see Scott and his men return, and they didn't. The search parties finally found them dead in November of that year out on the ice, and they buried them uh, under ice and snow, and those men are still drifting slowly out to sea. They'll probably get there in another few hundred years. Before Scott's crew left Antarctica, they erected a cross on top of Observation Hill. Sadly, that's a modern replacement. The cross had a simple line from Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Exploration is nothing without ambition. This photograph the blue marble was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts in December 1972 as they began the first human off-the-planet experience. They were heading to the moon and looked back, and they were the first people to see the world, our Earth, our ecosystem, in its entirety for the first time. They took this picture. Yes, that is the South Pole at the top, and New Zealand close by, because in space there's no gravity, so it doesn't kind of matter which way you hang, they were seeing the world upside down. Maybe it's time for us to see the world upside down too. But with every great ambition, and ours is the greatest ambition of all for humankind, is, is how can 10 billion people or so live well on this planet? Because the way we are doing life now, human life now, doesn't work. We are heading for ecological disaster. I will only tell a few stories about this. First of all, this chart. This is what's going on with the planet. These are the nine physical chemistry, chemical boundaries of the planet um, as drawn up and measured by the Stockholm Resilience Institute. We know all about uh, the big ones like climate change and ocean acidification, but note the biggest breach of those planetary boundaries is the nitrogen flow uh, which is because of artificial fertilizers. It's the nitrogen flow into our waters, into our aquifers and rivers here in Canterbury, around the country, which is poisoning our ecosystem. That's what it looks at like at a global scale. But the biggest, the very biggest, is at 11 o'clock, approaching midnight. That's biodiversity loss. So I'll tell you two stories about biodiversity loss. This one. This is Paris on a good day. Automotive smog kills several million people a year around the world. Governments have put in emission standards to try to reduce that smog. Volkswagen couldn't meet those standards, so a small <laughs> tweak of the software meant that its engines ran sweet and beautiful in a lab test. Out on the road in real life, they emit up to 40 times the legal limit of nitrogen oxides, which kill people. They have put 11 million of those cars on the road since 2008. What was in their minds 
what was in their hearts when they did that. But what about us? There are only 14 pairs of breeding, breeding pairs of fairy terns left in New Zealand. There is possibly 55 Maori dolphins left, and there's the only ones in the world of that bird, that dolphin. Yet, we keep searching for oil offshore New Zealand, even though the oil companies of the world, by the most conservative estimate, already have three times on reserves found that we can ever possibly burn if we're not going to cook the planet. And we're doing that where those last few Maori dolphins live. Now, we could say, well, what's a fairy tern worth? What's a Maori dolphin worth? But here's the issue. With every species that dies, with every human being that dies, we snip another few strands in the web of life. It's unraveling. We're compromising the ecosystem, which is our life support system. The planet's been here five times before. Each time a natural disaster of some kind has drastically changed the climate and the life forms on the planet. This is the sixth extinction. It's our first as humankind, and we are causing it in the Anthropocene. But where might hope lie? Science and technology certainly play a role. Wonderful people like um, McDonough, the American architect, and Braungart, his great partner in this, uh, the German chemist, talking about how we've got to borrow from nature and return to nature. So everything we make, we can completely unmake and reuse as nature does, down to parts per billion. That's beyond the wildest dreams anyone has of recycling now. We can also borrow some wonderful technology from nature. Biomimicry is the field. Janine Benyus, a great American biologist, is one of the great exponents of it. Top of the picture, in the middle, a modern, apart a modern office complex in Harare, in Africa. It's high up uh, land-wise there, so it's hot during the day and cold during the night. But those office buildings have no mechanical heating or ventilation at all because they rely on air flows that are modeled on what happens inside an ant heap. Other people dream of these sorts of things. This is theoretically how we might build a biodegradable, infinitely recyclable solar-powered aircraft. And there's lots of that in this for us, because that body, that fuselage, those wings, would be made from biocompounds with flax as their main constituency. And gosh, we do flax well. So maybe we might yet have an aviation industry in New Zealand. And then, of course, there are gorgeous, gorgeous places, like this fabulous place of the Tuhoi are built in the Uruweras um, as their, their main council place. This is the first living building in New Zealand. That's a very challenging discipline, a very challenging designation, whereby buildings uh, generate an, uh, all the energy they need and look after all the water they need in terms of capturing it and recycling it. But this building, I think, is really important not just because of that technology, because it gives body to those great ideas in a very New Zealand way. This is palpably a New Zealand building. It's not some pale imitation of anybody else's building. And so on this journey, we will learn from many other people from around the world. We will contribute what we know and what we can develop to other people. But through all this, we need to be truly ourselves um, in terms of the remarkable mix of cultures we are here, Maori, Pakeha, Pacific Islanders, Asians, and all the rest. Um, and we bring that together in a very special way in New Zealand um, that can respond to these issues. So this is some of the exploration. This is some of the journey we need about how we live with nature. Now, science and technology, though, can only take us so far. Gus Beth, a great American scientist, founder of organizations like the World Resources Institute. At the United Nations, he was a 
precursor, but one before, to Helen Clark as head of the United Nations Development Program. A couple of years ago, he said, I used to think that the three great ecological issues for us were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could solve those problems. But I've come to realize that the great ecological issues are greed, selfishness, and apathy. To solve those, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Roy Scranton, new book, wonderful American writer. He says that we are so deeply into the Anthropocene, we are so deeply destroying our ecosystem uh, because of our civilization, that we have to realize that our civilization is dead. This is not the civilization that can take us on down the road to living well with nature. Therefore, we have to learn how to die to live. Two more guides on this journey. This is the wonderful statue of Ed Hillary overlooking Auraki. In those mountains, the first one he climbed as a young lad, young teenager, Mount Olivier overlooking Auraki. I think he learned a lot about life. And it was a great ambition for me always to meet Ed Hillary. And when I finally got the chance to move to New Zealand with my family in 1997, I thought, gosh, I'll be close to Ed Hillary, perhaps I might meet him. <laughs> Turns out we actually didn't live very far away, but I never met him, until some friends were moving to the United States, and they had a going away party at their house. Turned out that Ed and June lived next door. This was quite late in Ed's life, so he didn't stop long at the party. I saw him come in, I was so excited, but I was completely frozen. What do you ask a man like Ed Hillary about Everest? Every conceivable question must have been asked. How boring could I be to ask one of those? <laughs> I agonized for ages. I could see him standing there with June talking to people. I couldn't bring myself to go and say anything to him. I finally had the right question. But then a really boring person interrupted me and said, <laughs> and asked me these insane questions. And I was too polite. I was too timid. I was too patient to say, forget it. I want to go and ask Ed something. <laughs> By the time I finally broke away and headed for Ed, Ed and June were heading for the door, and I never got to ask my question. But I think it's really important <laughs> that I can imagine what Ed would have said if I'd asked him the question. And here's the question. On that Everest expedition, a young British Army officer called Captain James Morris was the journalist, embedded of course, who was to write the story and organize a deeply secret way to get the message out that should Hillary or somebody else on the expedition be successful and be the first people to the top of Everest, the news could be got secretly back to London in time for Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Amazing bloke, James Morris. A little later in life, a few things changed for him. He became Jan Morris. Indeed, he had a sex change operation, and he went on to become a wonderful, wonderful travel writer. So I was going to say to Ed, Ed, what did you make of Captain James Morris at Everest, and now Jan Morris, the travel writer? And I would imagine Ed, with his huge heart, his great humanity, that twinkle in his eye, that chuckle in his mind, he would say, well, James was a fine fella, and Jan's a lovely lady. Last person, Kerno, 1942, depths of the Second World War. He writes, landfall in unknown seas. And he poses the greatest challenge that I think any New Zealander has posed to us and to the world. He wrote, now there are no more islands to be found. And the eye scans risky horizons of its own in unsettled weather and murmurs of the drowned haunt our familiar beaches. Who navigates us towards what unknown but not improbable provinces? Who reaches a future down for us from the high shelf 
of spiritual daring. Thank you.